everyone, welcome. This is the interview on Linda EKG TV. It's our first episode for 2018 and I am so excited. <laughs> My name is Tokma Olonio and with me on the show today is the beautiful and delectable Benedicta Elechi, <laughs> CEO Taste Buds and Dictachi Foods. Let's be her. Hi, hi. Hello. <laughs> How are you Tokme. doing? Good to finally meet you in person. I have met your foods. <laughs> <laughs> I have met you. <laughs> Same I'm here. I'm good. So t I'm, well, I must talk about taste buds. You're on Instagram. You are popping like you're breaking Aww. the internet. With oh, amazing thank you. food. So when did you, thank you when did you discover that you wanted to go into catering? I think that's what they call mm. it. Yeah. I'll say from a very early age. Okay. And um, I started catering way back 2000 and 2004 in oh, Port wow. Harcourt. Okay. Yes. That was where I started my first company. Okay. It was a catering company, a catering, a yogurt manufacturing company, and okay. a bakery company as well. Oh, okay. So now I know we've we've been seeing quite a lot on about taste buds, but Dictachi Foods are they? Is it still in the works? Is it still, uh, is it still happening, or are you just focusing on taste buds now? Uh, currently, I'm focusing on taste buds. We've uh, stopped production for a while in Potakot. Um, that's Diktachi Foods Nigeria Limited has stopped production for a while because of um, some issues we're having. Like one is the uh, current cut suit in Potakot. You know, I, okay. I, I filed for a divorce from my ex-husband in 2012. It is seven years now. And one of the things I asked uh, the court to uh, remit or to uh, give back to me was the 20% shares of the company that I gave to my ex-husband, Mr. Paul Ochenio Odekina of Total ENP. I think uh, he's the executive general manager, human resources, Total ENP. Okay. Yeah, I gave him 20% uh, of the company. Um, willingly, you know how you want to start a business and you don't want to be selfish. <laughs> you want everybody to have a part of it. So uh, when I filed for the divorce, I asked for my 20% to be given back to me. And I can tell you ever since then, Diktachi Foods has not known peace. So with everything that happened or that ensued from that, we just had no option but to stop production of yogurt, the bread uh, production and the industrial catering aspect of the business, we had to shut down everything. Not because the court asked us to, but because of the constant harassment we kept getting from Mr. Paul Odekina, irrespective of the, the, the court asking uh, him to stay clear of the premises until judgment is given. Yeah. I am the managing director, CEO of Diktachi Foods Nigeria Limited. So despite the constant harassment uh, from Mr. Paul Ucheni Odekina of Total, you know, he, he uh, I think sometime last month or last two months, uh, there was a break into my factory. That was uh, last year. That was uh, last year, I think late last year. Uh, the factory premises was boggled. Most of our heavy machineries were vandalized and some were carted away with. So my security personnel called me up the next day and told me, and I asked her to get the police involved. So upon inspection of the factory premises by the police to find out what must have gone wrong or who the culprits might have been, they came for the in investigations and they saw a driver's license of Martins Odekina. Now Martins Odekina happens to be the younger brother of my ex-husband, Mr. Paul Odekina. So his driver's license was found in my company premises. Now my company premises has been locked up by me and the key given to my security personnel and myself, I'm the only one with the key. So how come his driver's license was found at the site of the, the crime? You know, It was found in my company premises. So I have a photocopy of the driver's license and the original was kept by the police uh, officer. He took it to the police station 
Amadiyama, I think the police station at Amadiyama, because they were the ones that came to investigate what could have happened in my factory. So it didn't just stop there, you know. Right now, I think uh, two days ago, you know, two days ago, I got a call from my security guard telling me that he came to the premises. Who is the he now? Paul Odekina Your of Total, my ex-husband. He came to the premises two days ago informing them that he was coming on Monday. That's today. He's, he's going to be there today to get them arrested. Okay. That they have no business securing my premises. This is a company that is owned by me. 20% only of the company's shares was what I gave to him. The factory is situated on three plots of land. Two plots, we jointly bought two plots when, the, when I started this business uh, in 2007 was when I started constructing. Okay. So two plots of the land is jointly owned by us. And then when the business grew, I bought an additional plot, solely my name on the, court, on the land document, which I have here. So if you're going to look at it legally, if you do want to look at it legally, I have two plots of the land and he has just one. But the factory situated on it is owned by me and only 20% of it was given to him by me. So I see no reason why someone that owns a minority share should dictate who the security personnel of the company owned by me should be. So are you so, saying these whole issues are coming up because of the divorce case? Yes, these whole issues are coming up because of the divorce case. And for how long have you been battling this divorce? Since 2012 January, I filed for a divorce in 2012 January from Mr. Paul Odekina of Total. And we have been going back and forth. I mean. The, the case obviously is not, is not ending for whatever reason, I, I, I do not know. Sorry, sorry that I ask this, but if it's been going back and forth, isn't it something that you could possibly settle amicably or to restore the marriage? We have therapy sessions, we have family that could intervene. Isn't it something that you could probably just sit down together and find a way to resolve this? You have kids, right? Yes, we do. Is it something you you can possibly settle? No, <laughs> no, it's definitely not. I filed from a divorce from him because of his sexual perversion. And uh, there is a point where you get to as a human being when you realize that something or whatever it is you're in is never going to work. Because when I signed a contract to marry him. I believed I was, you know, marrying a man that shared the same uh, type of sexuality with me. Not to get me wrong, I do not have any issues with uh, people that, you know, have different sexual orientation. I do not have any issue with that. But when you come and you say you want to go into a marriage contract with someone, you both have to share the same sexual orientation. So when you get into that marriage and you find out that this was not what you bargained for, it's like you were tricked into the marriage. The marriage is a sham. It's not what you, you taught. For ex example, um, we got married in 2002. I filed for a divorce in 2012. I filed. For the 10 year period we were married, we actually had sex 11 times, I'm sorry. We actually had sexual intercourse 11 times in 10 years. He wouldn't let me sleep in his room. I have to stay in my own room. He would only come to see me when he thinks we should make a baby. Okay. Way into the marriage, I caught him red-handed in gay sex. I walked into him in our living room in, um, I think at, at about 1.30, 1.40 a.m. with a, a guy I can't, 
I, I can't rec I don't really know who he is, but he obviously walked in with that person at that time of the night. And I walked into them in our living room. And I can tell you, it was a struggle. We live in a society where you have to do everything as a woman to preserve your marriage. Everything, even to the point of death. You have to do everything it takes. You are in it. You can come out of it. You just have to pray. God can change things. I'm not saying I'm not a believer in God, but there are certain things that we need to know when God, you know, is talking to you. It's a bit emotional for me because there are lots of women out there that have gone through what I have gone through and they can come out. I'm sorry, but this was one of the reasons why I never wanted to do an interview because the pain, what I went through, is real and it can only take a lifetime to, to forget. It is hell. It is hell. When you have to stay and just try to make your marriage work year in and year out. Did you, did you talk to your family about it? Did you talk to anybody about it? That's the emotional blackmail part I talk about. When you feel that marriage is something both parties have to work on. You don't have to bring in third parties into it. And you can, you know, Give him some time to change. You can pray about it. And this is him begging you constantly. Don't leave me. Don't divorce me. If you do that, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to commit suicide. I don't want you to tell my parents. I don't want you to tell your parents. I promise you I'm going to change. And you desperately want to believe that this person is going to change because you want your marriage to work. And you just find that the years are going by. You are in it. You can't come out. Who do you really want to tell is a stigma. And then you have kids. You don't want them to be laughed at in school. So you just stay. Okay. This is your experience, but do you have any evidence that you could you could present for people to know that beyond your word of mouth that he actually has a gay relationship and is married to you? There were some text messages I saw on his phone. He sent he sent to a man that he actually brought home for dinner. Okay, he brought him home for dinner. I made dinner for them. And when I saw the text message on his phone, I was livid. I was livid. I so, had to confront him with it. And I'm like, you can't bring someone to the house. And you tell me um, he's a guest I should entertain. And this is actually what you do. This is the kind of relationship you have with this person. Why are you punishing me? Why are you doing this to me? If you know this marriage is, is a sham, let me go. So after the first time you caught him, and then... I have the, I even have the, the, the message. I have it. Okay, I'd like to see it. I, I have it on my phone. Sorry, okay, please. let's go on a quick Can break. I? When we come back, we would be looking at the message she has as proof of her husband, of her ex-husband cheating on her. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're still talking to Miss Benedicta Elichi, who shares with us her ordeal with her ex-husband, Mr. Paul Odekina. Let's get right back in. 
Okay, so before we went on the break, you were telling me about the evidence you had and the text message which you would like to share. Yes. Uh, the text message, uh, it's on his phone. You know, I got the text message that he sent to this friend of his that he brought over for dinner. And it's, it's right here on my phone. I wanted it to, you know, to look at it because when I saw it, I, I had to wake him up because he was sleeping on, on, in the couch, you know, watching how you watch TV and you sleep off. And, you know, I just picked up the phone, his phone, and the message just came in. And I confronted him with this, and he went all crazy on me. You have no right, no right to, to pick up my phone. I said, I didn't have airtime on my own. I just wanted to use yours. To, he said, you have no right. I want you never to get to my phone. I said, but is this what you really do? You bring somebody to the house for me to feed for dinner, and this is it? You're in a relationship with this guy, in a sexual relationship with this guy. So I just... So what was the content of the message? Yeah, I said, when next uh, we're together, you know, we'll create time to spend, we'll spend more time with each other. I miss you, sweetness. The boys and the girls are keeping me warm. The boys and? And the girls are keeping me warm, you know, and that is, this is still his current phone. This is the number. He's still using up till date, I think, because as of last month, I still saw the phone number on my uh, children's exit card in school. So it's still the number he... he Was he the one that um, sent the message saying the boys and the girls are keeping me warm, or was it the friend? It was the friend that sent it to him in response to his message of, I miss you, sweetness. Okay. So, all right, so apart from this um, evidence you've given and what you have had to see, have you had any form of abuse in this marriage? Oh, yes, um, severally, but it always stems from us fighting over, you know, quarreling over me, not allowing boys to come to the house to give him erotic massage or insisting I'm going to burn up his gay porn magazines. There was a time I actually burnt all the gay porn magazines in, in his room and he gave me a beating of my life when he came back that day. I had no right to walk into his room. I, I have no right to touch anything that belongs to him. But you were still married at the time. Yes, I was still married and... But you he, said he... When you first caught him, he apologized and said he was going to work on himself to stop being gay. Yes. You see, it's, it's a back and forth thing. Sometimes he would apologize after an outburst, and then he'll come back and tell me, you are all that I have, you and the kids. If you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to die. You don't want to do this to your children. You don't want to do this. To me, I'm going to change. But the same person will still beat you. When I confronted him, or I, I got really mad at the, when I see he's not changing, he's not showing those signs he has promised to, to make. First, we're still not having sexual intercourse for whatever reason. And the story is, I'm working on myself, be patient, I'm going to come around and everything will be all right. I love you so much if you, if you, if you leave me, I will die. Okay, now let's rewind so, quickly to when you were dating. Did you ever see any signs that he was um, bisexual? Because if he has sexual relationship with you, just not as often as you would want it, means that he does have sex with women, right? I don't want to be assuming. Yeah, when I was, uh, when we were dating, I was a student in the university then, so I would come around on Friday evenings after lectures, or he would pick me up after lectures on Friday evenings, and, you know, on Saturdays I'll cook for him and watch, watch a movie, 
and we'll have sex and then he'll take me back to school on Sunday. So my movement was, I think it was well calculated or planned out by him because he knows for one, I'll never come when it's a weekday because I have lectures to attend. And I remember one of those weekends I came and I saw a blue pill because then I was an undergraduate of analytical chemistry in the university and it was Viagra, I saw it. And I was like, Paul, what are you doing with this? And he, sh he showed surprise and he was like, oh my goodness, what is it doing there? You know, I traveled out of the country and I let my friend stay over with some of his girlfriends. Maybe he must have used that. And he was so upset and he said he was going to tell the guy he should never do this in his bedroom and all that. So I discarded it as one of those things men do, boys do, whatever. But later into the marriage, when I discovered that from the date we got married, our white wedding was on the 26th of January, 2002. From that day we got married, he wouldn't touch me. Even on the wedding wouldn't, night? On our wedding night. And I even told him, I said, look, there's this uh, superstitious belief that if you do not consummate your, your marriage on, on the wedding day, it follows you like throughout the marriage. And he was like, are you not tired after all the dancing and the money spraying? Don't you want to sleep? So I pushed it aside and I said, okay, maybe he's tired today. But from the first, from that day, which is the 26th of January, he wouldn't sleep with me for so many reasons. The, 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 the next time I, I, I actually threw a tantrum was December 17th. I remember we went to the company's end of year party. It was a total Christmas end of year party. And, you know, we went for the party. A lot of his colleagues wanted to dance with me and all that. And then when we came back, he, for the first time since January 2000 and, uh, 2012, January 26, 2012, when we had our white wedding for the very Twelve first time. 2002. 2002. January 2002, when we had our white wedding. Up until December 17th, that was the very first time he attempted. So for 11 months? Yes. You're sure that for 11 from months? From the day we got married, which was January 2002, 26th of January. You see, the dates we had sexual intercourse throughout the 10 years of marriage. They are, they are so few that I can remember exactly what happened prior to that incident, even what I wore. Okay. So from January 2002 up until December 17th, he didn't touch me. Okay, now within th those 11 months, was that when you caught him? Yes, that was when I caught him with the guy in our living room, he was having sexual intercourse with a guy in our living room. So the next time was your, was the total end of year party? Yes. And I remember him telling me that this year I know has been traumatic for you, but I'm promising you I'm going to change. I love you very much and I want to work on what we have. And we started and he couldn't get it up. And that was when my, my mind went back to the Viagra pill I saw when we were dating. And I brought up the question, I said, were you using pills whenever I come to visit you during the weekend? And he, of course, he flared up, he was like, I was crazy for thinking that. Why would I think that every weekend I came to see him, he was using Because I started putting two and two together. Maybe he was keeping up appearances, making me feel everything was okay, he was a normal guy. Because, I mean, I would come to visit him from, the, from, from my school. And on the weekend, we'll actually sleep. And on Sunday, I'll go back to school. So how come all of a sudden everything just, you know? And it was like that for the entire 10 years we were married. So, okay.
I knew no. this wasn't where I wanted to be. I needed to be in a proper, healthy, loving relationship. And I filed. I filed. After 10 years. After 10 years. And I remember the Christmas of 2011. I remember telling him that come January 2012, my New Year present to you will be a divorce suit. And he laughed. He said, you, divorce me. <laughs> My friend, better go back and take care of those children. You think you want to divorce me? I will drag you through any suit until you're 40. How old are you now? You are 33. And you think you want to divorce me? Until you're 40, I will drag you through it. And he just, you know, sarcastically, he just walked past me like I was crazy. You know, like I didn't know what I was talking about. And in all <laughs> fairness to him, I filed in, filed in 2012, January. I was 33. Mm, I'm going to be 40 this. I'm going to be 40 this August. I'm still going back and forth, I'm doing the same thing in the court. And I'm not getting any results. So I don't know. At this point, I don't know what to say. Is because everybody I have, you know, everybody I have told that I've been in a divorce, in a divorce suit since 2012, every single person tells me it's not true. So, this is the seventh year. This is the seventh year. The sixth year ended January, uh, January 12th, which was the date I filed. So from January 13th this year, I'm in the seventh year. And your children, how are they handling it? I tried for so long to shield them, you know, to shield them from the scars of this divorce as much as I could. But what kept me going on was I knew I was better off a life and a life and away from their father than being dead because a bad marriage can drive you or drive anyone to an early grave. It, it is not something I wish for anyone, you know, so you're better off a life and divorced and taking care of your kids from separate homes than growing up knowing that you lost a parent to a bad marriage or you lost a parent in the cause of a divorce. It's been, it's not been easy for them, especially for my first child. She's, she's going to be 16 now because she was the one that, you know, was she, she, she was the oldest, so she... I remember her asking me once when she went for a sleepover at, at a friend's house. She was in primary five then, and she came home and she said, Mommy, how come you don't share a room with Daddy? I went to Maya's house, and the mom had this huge teddy bear in Daddy's room, and the, the Daddy gave it to her, and... And they used to play a lot. And I was and I realized that this is definitely not how to raise children. You know, they're growing up in a home, they have a father and a mother. But they don't know that father and the mother should be together or share any form of intimacy. So you don't want to raise your kids that way. And she used to see me cry a lot and she would ask, Mommy, why are you always crying? And I said, something fell into my eyes. And lately, um, I think two years ago, when she went to visit her dad, she ran back to my house. You know, I was living in 1004 at that time. She ran back to my house. I was actually supposed to go to school to pick them up for their holidays, but 
for whatever reason, the, the dad beat me to it, got to the school and demanded he wanted his kids. And the school authorities let him have the, the two of them and he took them home. I was distraught. I wrote several emails to my lawyers, I wrote asking him to bring back my children. He had no right to go to the school to pick them up on that date, you know, because usually they will come to me for holidays and I would organize like a chaperone to take them to see him for some part of the holiday, not him just going to the school and taking them by himself. And a week later, my daughter ran back she ran to my house. I was at home and my nanny was screaming, Madam, Madam, see Daniela, see Daniela. I stood with my towel. I was looking at my daughter in front of the door and I'm like, Daniela, what happened? She said, Mommy, I ran from daddy's house. And I was like, what happened? What happened? And she told me she cannot stay with a man that, a father that asks her, uh, that, that would ask her to feel free to walk around naked in the house and he would insist that she should allow him to be in the room when she was dressing. This is a 14 year old girl. Okay, she's, she, yes, yeah, she's a child, but she's not a child. She's 14 and we all know what a 14 year old child looks like. Daniela, your father said I came to your estate to pick you up against your will to my own estate. Have you ever seen me in your estate? And why did you leave your father's house? I have never seen you in my estate before and I ran away by myself running past the gates because I knew I would find a taxi somewhere. I eventually did and asked you to bring me here. So you guys saw me here yesterday. I left because I wasn't comfortable living with someone who had told me that I shouldn't be ashamed to be naked in front of my father. And again, he wouldn't let me have access to anyone's phones. He actually gave an order saying that they shouldn't give me their phones so I wouldn't be able to talk to my mom. He does this anytime she's in the shower. She said, whenever I'm in the shower, he has a habit of coming into the room and he will insist he sits down there for me to get dressed. And I tell him that, no, daddy, you can't do this. I, you're not supposed to be in my room. And he said, my friend, will you shut up? This is my house. I can go into any room I like whenever I want to. And then he wouldn't let the, her call me. He instructed everybody in the house not to give her a phone so she would not have access to me. So she, she, she just had to leave the house and come to my house. And when I heard this, it reminded me of the same pattern that my brother told me. Because I used to have a younger brother living with me when we were uh, initially married. He used to live with me and I used to remember my ex-husband asking him to come to his room and give him a massage, you know. One minute. Yes. Let's go on a quick break. When we come back, we would find out exactly what happened between her ex-husband and her younger brother. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are still talking to Miss Benedicta Elici, and I'm sure there's so much we've heard and there's still a lot more to learn. Let's get right back in. Yes, so you were sharing with us earlier about your younger brother's experience. Yes, yeah, so what my daughter told me reminded me of a pattern because my younger brother, when he was uh, living with us earlier on in our marriage life, he would ask my younger brother, would ask him to come and massage him, like give him a massage. So initially, you know, I thought there was nothing wrong with that. It's this is my younger brother, irrespective of the fact of what I know about his sexual orientation. That's Mr. Paul Undikina. What I knew about his sexual orientation, irrespective of that, I felt this was my younger brother. He will not. He cannot try anything funny. I mean, you can't bring it close home. So I looked away. I, I never used to see it as anything. He would go there, he would give him a massage, he would go back to his room. And then one day I came back from work. My brother had packed his things out of the house. And I realized that prior to that time, 
he started complaining about my younger brother that he's so lazy he can't do anything anymore he can't wash the cars he can't sweep the floor he's just so lazy and i'm like this guy is practically one of the most hard-working people who have living in this house you remember i left him with you and i traveled to the states to have our second baby he was the one cooking for you, cleaning, going to the market, doing every domestic chores. And when I got back, you told me how useful he was, how wonderful, how come all of a sudden, I said, you know what, I'm going to have a word with him. And I called my younger brother, I said, oh, what's going on? He used to speak so well of you, what's happening? He said, nothing, nothing, you know, and a few days later, he packed and he left. I was very upset because I felt, I mean, you're my younger brother, I've taken care of you, you know, for like, ever since I was born, it's like seven years my junior. I love him so much. So much. There are some of your siblings you feel you are a mother to, you're not just a sister, you know? And I felt... <laughs> so he... He didn't even talk to me. I called my mom. I, I raked. I told my mom he's an ingrate. And he just, you know, just, just leave. I didn't even know anything. It was, it was like two years later, you know, that my brother that was visiting the country you know, confided in me and he told me that, uh, do you really know why your brother left, uh, why he left your house? It was because Paul used to tell him to massage his private parts, you know, and as a 19 year old, he would, he would massage his private part. And there was a day he now told him to bend over, you know, and my brother was like, God forbid, I'll never do that. You ask me for a massage, I give you a massage. That is it. And he walked out of his room and he packed his things and he left and that was why he left my house and my elder brother went on to interview him like okay how did this all start and he said it will start whenever he heard the shower in his room when he hears the, sh the shower it's running he would know he was taking his shower and he will go into the room at that moment and he will sit on the bed and you know be conversing with him and he felt so uncomfortable like i mean wow well, you know why would you be taking a shower and there's this person sitting and watching you and he would tell him how buffed he was how he had a six pack and you have a great body you know so he said why are you uncomfortable i'm a guy like you now nah, so i can't just watch you shower but, you know so that was how it started and you know it progressed so when my daughter told me, my little 14-year-old daughter told me, he always insists on coming to sit when she's taking her shower. And he always knew when the shower comes. So it just rang a bell in my head. And I'm like, this is not going to happen a second time. As a child, you know, we don't even know what it means to be sexually abused. We don't even know the early signs of it. We don't know anything. But she as soon as she mentioned it to me and told me, he said she should feel free to walk around naked when the father is around. I'm your father. You should trust me. I mean, you should feel free in my presence. That was read a lot for me. I wrote a letter to his best friend telling him, or one of his closest friends then, telling him that he should not in his entire life try anything funny with my daughter. I wrote a letter to his company. Uh, to his boss, that's uh, a total ENP, uh, total um, petroleum. As in, I wrote a letter to his MD. I wrote a letter to a few of his senior colleagues I felt could call him to order. I even wrote a letter to my child's school informing them of the development. But what I notice is we live in a country where if something hasn't happened, people don't work on signs, they don't work on uh, assumptions, they overlook a lot of things. But I think it's wrong 
for a full grown man, a father to tell a 14 year old child that is obviously matured that you can feel free to walk around my presence naked. Uh, I can come into your room anytime I want because I own this house and all the rooms in this house belongs to me. So, so I would say for my eldest daughter, the whole divorce proceeded has been um, traumatic for her. And after that, been. after that day that she ran back to your house, did he did he come to apologize? Did he no, do anything? He didn't. He said he saw nothing wrong with that. That she was. Uh, the one reading reading too many meanings into it. And after all, she was, he was her father, you know. Because I remember bringing this up with the school principal. Excuse me, where my where my child schools and he said there was that she was the one misinterpreting things that he didn't see anything wrong with, you know, walking into her room. And he obviously didn't tell her to feel free to walk around naked. That she was making that up. So it's her word against his. He's okay. So this happened. This has been um, on for seven years. So what moved you to come out to talk about it now? Because the harassment from Mr. Paul Odekina has not stopped. His harassment. Of my factory premises, for example, that happened two days ago, hasn't stopped. This is a case that has been brought before the court. Why don't you exercise patience if you feel you have a claim on the property? Why don't you exercise patience until judgment has been given? I have spoken to people I felt um, were his close family members. I have spoken with his very close friends. I've spoken with some of his colleagues, people I feel will be in a position to talk to him, to calm down and wait for the outcome of the ruling. But I will not have this. There was an attempted kidnap on my life. Uh, that was uh, three years, uh, um, I think three, four years ago. It's a matter that was uh, opened in SARS. I came from Port Harcourt to Lagos to drop my child off in school and I was followed by two men in a vehicle. You know, they followed me after dropping my child off. You know, they kept trailing me and I knew I was being followed. Okay, so I, I started calling for help. You know, I started telling people that I'm in a car. I feel I am being followed. What do I do? They said, okay, keep on driving. Get to Marwa roundabout. Calm down. You will see police. Uh, men controlling traffic scream for help and that was what I did. I drove up onto Marwa police station, the car kept following me and as soon as I parked the car at the Marwa roundabout, I tiptoed out of the car barefoot and I screamed for help and I said please help me, help me, there's, there's a car following you. One of the guys has actually come down from the car and the guy was walking towards me really fast. So I, when he saw me talking to the police officer, he immediately changed his direction. So I kept screaming, I said, police, go after that guy. He came down from that car and that is the car. So the patrol van ran after the Camry and then the guy that was controlling the traffic ran after the guy that I pointed out to him that was now walking really fast away from me. So he ran and he just held him. He was on the phone, obviously calling the people in the car to run. So they held him and they said, Madam, is it this guy? He said, yes, he's the one, he's the one. He just highlighted from that car that you, your van is chasing after. They want to kidnap me. I noticed they've been following me from Ekpe Expressway, that's from uh, Awoyaya. Okay. Yeah, they followed me uh, from the airport to Awoyaya, from Awoyaya, they were following me back to Marwa. So they held the guy, they were, so the police officer held on to him and said, do you know this woman? He said, no, I don't know how. I said, it's a lie, he's a kidnapper, I just came down from that car. So the guy said, kidnapper. The policeman slapped him, slapped him again and just brought out his gun. I said, do you know this man? I said, yes, yes, ah, ah, Emma Mua, Emma Mua, you know, it's like, don't bring the gun, don't bring the gun. Yes, I know her, I know her. 
So why are you following her? Why do you want to kidnap her? Why do you want to kidnap her? He's on a video. I have the video here with me. He said, ah, I don't know her before. It was the husband that set her up. You say what? He said, it was the husband that set her up. I don't know her. Don't shoot me. So they took the guy. Obviously, the people in the van, the, the run after the, the, Cam, the, the Camry, because I even also have pictures of the, the plate number of the car and the car, which I, I handed over to the police. Because while they were trailing me, I went really low. You know, I've lived in Port Harcourt all my life. It's the peak of kidnap. When, when you talk about Port Harcourt insecurity issues, we have a whole lot of kidnap incidents. And one of the things they taught us is if you notice a car is trailing you, go low into the car and try to take a picture of the car or the plate number. That might help in investigation. That is if you escape. So I took a picture of the plate number of the car that was following me while I was inside my taxi car. So I handed over the picture to the police officers. And they said they were going to take the plate number of the car to Auto Reg. They went to Auto Reg. And they came back the next day and said the plate number is fake. The plate number is not registered. And the guy that was caught and and taken to Marwa police station, the matter was now transferred to SARS at Ikeja. I have the police report where it was transferred to SARS, and we all went to SARS the next day, and they told us that um, our matter has been entered, and I shouldn't worry, I should go home and relax, that they are going to try the matter, that when the matter comes up in the court, that they were going to call me so that I can appear and identify the guy. That they were now going to drill the guy to tell them who actually sent them. So I went home. Two days later, I didn't get any call from SARS. I went back to SARS, like, what is going on? Uh, they said, we sh I shouldn't worry that. He gave them a lead that day to, to go and look for the other guys. And they went there, some outskirt area in Lagos, and on arrival, they told them that the guy rushed in. The neighbor said, ah, Otilo, that he came that night about past 1 a.m., picked his wife, his mother, and his baby, and left the compound. Wow. So the only lead they have now is the guy they caught that said on video that it was the husband that set up. That's the only guy they have. So I said, okay, now, are we going to try this guy? So maybe they try him, he'll produce every other person that was involved. They said, yes, they're going to try him, they'll get back to me. Three days later, I went back to SARS. They told me that this, the, the guy has been bailed um, under the human rights law that you do not have the right to detain anyone uh, 48 hours after arrest, that the guy has been bailed. So I said, what is going to happen? He said, Madam, don't worry. Even if it takes us one year, we are going to catch them. We'll get back to you. So that was, that was how I didn't get to hear anything from SARS after six months. I think after three months, I didn't get to hear from I think the fourth month, I called my lawyer up and I said, look, it's like they're not going to try this case anymore. I need you to write to the IG of police, you know, petitioning SARS Ikeja like what really happened with this case. Because when I went back, they told me that the inspectors in charge that matter, uh, the, they, 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 the, 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 I think they were transferred. They told me they were transferred to other police stations. So right now, the people, they don't even know anything about my case. So I had to call my lawyer. I said, this is the situation. The officers in charge, my matter in that um, Sazi Keja no longer work there. They are now in other police stations. What do we do? And he was like, OK, we're going to write a letter to the IG of police, you know, asking them to investigate further. The first letter was written to the office of the IG. No response came. When my lawyer tried to, you know, find out what happened, they said the letter was missing in transit. You know, they never got it. My lawyer wrote a second letter. And up until today, no response. So that was how that matter just, you know. This was three years ago. Yeah, about three, yeah, about three, four years, years ago. ago. Yeah. So up until now, you said um, Mr. Paul Odekina went to your, um, the premises of yes. your company and to ask them to leave two days ago. So he stays in, he's presently in Port Harcourt. I wouldn't know where he is, but he was there, there two, two days, days ago. ago. And he told them that if he should come back on Monday to uh, meet my security personnel, that he was going to lock him up 
and I'm here with like the CAC certificate of my company showing where I gave him just 20% of the company. I'm the chairman, director of the company. I'm here with a land document showing that I own two plots of the three plots of land the company is situated on. So I don't know on what grounds he claims ownership of my business. Every attempt to caution him to stay clear of my premises and to stop harassing my employ, em, 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 empl empl employers has proven futile. Okay. All my employees, I mean, they've been so frustrated. I, ha I have so many of them that resigned when this harassment started, you know, because they were now not sure of their jobs, their, their, the security of their job. They wanted to go somewhere else, you know, threats of, we'll come here with soldiers, we're going to raid the premises, we're going to lock everybody up, you know. So there was just so much tension in the air, and it has not stopped. Okay. Now, apart from the obvious fact of the divorce, as, rega now, as regards him, the harassment at your work premises, have you reached out to him to have any form of amicable um, solution, or you, both of you are not in speaking terms at all? Initially, when the divorce uh, proceedings started, we had the, you know, the sit down with the lawyers to try to see how the divorce can move swiftly and children custody discussed and all of that. We didn't make any headway. You know, we didn't make any headway. I remember the, the George asking him to continue paying for the children's upkeep and nutrition and all that. He defied all that court orders. I mean, he didn't. He didn't. I've been taking care of my children for six years. No upkeep, nothing from your father. So we are not on speaking terms presently. Although every now and then I might get an email from him, you know, raining insults on me and my entire family. And when I get one, two, three, four of those insulting emails, I might respond to one or two of them and tell him, no, guy. Stop writing me. We have lawyers. Let's speak through them. So it's been, it's been, it's been war. You know, it's been war of words. So apart from it's, the fact that you both of you are not speaking terms, as regards his children, which are his responsibility too, has he been there for them in terms of their school fees, as playing a father, father, father role? Amongst the yeah, things. initially when I filed, he stopped everything. He said he wasn't paying the, the tuition. I remember my children staying back home after school had, had resumed because um, he wouldn't pay their fees. So I had to write his, uh, I had to write to his um, employers, you know, informing them that he has refused to pay their fees and they should please. It was more like a cry for help. They should please tell him to pay their fees. If not, I'll have to withdraw them from their school, uh, their present school, and put them into a, a more affordable school. You know, so I think, I don't know what happened, but he had a change of mind and insisted that he was going to pay for just two of the children, I was going to pay for the other two, and whatever the children needed, I should provide. So I provided shelter, driver, cars to chauffeur them to school, clothing, feeding, name it and I've been doing that for six years now so when people say you need to get married so you'll be secure in your marriage uh, should anything happen you have some security I don't see what security they are talking about because from my experience and what I've seen happen to so many women that filed from a divorce from their husbands most of the time you still end up getting nothing, which I think is really unfair for the children. Because, I mean, as adults, I mean, you can always take care of yourself. You can even take care of your children. But there are some certain uh, privileges your children maybe once enjoy. Because when you have income coming from both parties, you can tell that the children are definitely going to have more. But when you now have just one stream of income for the children, the children will have to readjust. So I think it's not fair on the part of the children that when you're going through a divorce in Nigeria, 
as a mom, you have to, you know, take care of your children and bear the financial burden 100%. Or maybe if you're lucky, like in my case, 80%. Because it's paying tuition for the first two while I have to pay for the other two and bear the cost of grooming them, whatever it is you know a child needs. The need to go for birthday parties, maybe they need uh, a violin for their music lessons, the need to be driven to school back and forth, the need to feed, the need to work. You just have to bear the responsibility. So what then is the security we hear uh, in Nigerian marriage? Oh, if you don't get married, it will boot you out and you will have nothing. It's <laughs> I, do, I, I don't get it. Okay. So now what steps are you taking apart from coming to make your, uh, your side of the story? What steps are you taking towards making sure that this year, which is the seventh year, as you said, to see that this divorce comes to life? That's a difficult question because I've always known that if you do the same thing over and over and over again, you, you're bound to get the same results. But in this situation, I think my hands are tied in the sense that the matter is already before the High Court. It has been before the High Court for this length of time. And we are advised to wait for the outcome of the ruling of the High Court. So I don't know when that will be. I don't know what can be done to facilitate it, if there's anything that can be done to facilitate it because, I don't know, I've tried everything possible, you know, go for every court hearing, speak to lawyers and ask their yeah, legal advice. I don't know what maybe women rights society or organization we have out there that can handle a, a situation like mine because I don't know what else to turn to. I don't know, so I don't know how, how long I still have to wait. So for women out there who have, who have or are experiencing some form of difficulties and are not seen or are trying to be the woman that keeps the family together and keep it together, because you kept it together for 10 years, Oh yes. you say. I even have uh, an email he sent to me uh, two years into the divorce proceedings. He sent me uh, that letter sometime in 2014. I even have a letter here where he commended me for uh, being a wonderful wife to him, uh, a homemaker, an industrious woman, and no woman deserves to have gone through what he put me to. He, and said, all he said all that. He even said he was uh, undergoing counseling to learn, to unlearn undesirable things and to know more about women related issues. You know, he said all that, you know, so I don't even know. The letter is here, I can even show you if you want to, okay. if, you oh, want to if you want to see the letter. So I don't know what to say to women out there that have been keeping the home and are maybe going through what I went through or are still in it. I don't know what, um, what of advice to give to them, but only thing I can say is that as human beings, we have different threshold for endurance. And when you know you have done everything in your, in your bid to save your marriage and you know, keep the marriage and you feel you have gotten to that point where you're, you're, you're gonna break, like you can't do it anymore and it's not getting any better. If both parties are not willing to change and make it work, then you just have to walk away. Your life is, is worth more fighting for and your children are better off knowing that you are alive and you are happy than just, you know, dying in a sham. So, that's it. You were married for 10 years and you've been battling the divorce for seven years. In and you've been, seventh, yes, in the seventh year now, and you've been away. You moved to Lagos from 
Quote, quote, quote. And we could say life has happened. You've moved on or you're in the process of moving on. So assuming this divorce goes through, no, not assuming, hopefully it does go through, which is what you want. Is there anybody, are you seeing any, am I in the place to ask if you're seeing anybody now? Or do you have plan? do you want to be single for the rest of your life? Or do you want to have a relationship with someone who shares the same sexual orientation as you do? When I was leaving my ex-husband, I told him I wanted to move on to experience what it feels like to be in a loving relationship, to experience what it feels like to be in a heterosexual relationship where I'll be loved, you know, and I moved on. When I left him, I moved on. I'm in a relationship now that is wonderful. I'm in a better place now. I'm engaged. So okay. <laughs> definitely when the divorce is all over, I would, I would get married again. And this time around, I hope. <laughs> I know it's going to be a beautiful thing. So I love love. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> it's not everybody that decides to, that considers to give it a second try. I mean, from all you said, from the emotions that you've purgated today, I can't see, I can see that you have been through a lot. And oh, yeah. how was the transition for you, moving from all that pain to being with someone else? That is the beauty of love. When you find someone that can relate with that level of pain, someone also coming from some somewhere like you're coming from like you speak the same language you understand each other you know he understands your pain he knows where you're coming from and you know where he's coming from the the connection is it's it's beautiful it's, it's so, so this person how long have you been with this person and do you know some people who don't want to speak but who is this person <laughs> His daddy freeze. <laughs> daddy freeze. Okay. So, how long has he? Um, how long have you been together? We've been together for about four years now. You know, there's actually been a transition in your expression. It's as if I'm talking <laughs> to two different people. I am happy that you have found happiness. I must Thank say, you. talking to you for how many minutes? I feel like I have been in your life for a very long time, <laughs> and I must say, I, I admire and I. I admire your strength and your whole journey. And for people out there who can help the situation, she has decided that she wants to move on and wants to finalize this divorce proceedings. And any organization that can help to see how this can be done and dusted once and for all, we would really appreciate if you could contact her, Taste Buds NG on Instagram, or you could, you, do you have a personal page on Instagram? Yes, Benedicta Elici. Okay, Benedicta Elici on Instagram. If you can help make this thing happen and give her an opportunity to love love <laughs> once again. This is the interview on Linda KG TV. If you have interesting life issues you would like to talk about, if you want to give people information on how they can make life better, not just petty talk, but share life, real life issues, you can also reach out to me on Instagram at TalkBoutOluoneo. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Linda Ikeji TV. Until next time, to take care of yourself.